the title of my talk is Shareholders Have Responsibilities. And there is a key Quaker word, uh, which is uh, stewardship. I think this is very important. And uh, we are and very far reaching. We are stewards of every one of the talents we possess, talents in every sense of the word. And our duty, you might say, is to put them to use uh, for the good of the community. And with respect to the uh, money side of talents, wealth, uh, Calvin, if I can quote Calvin, I published a book incidentally on how Calvin is much more closely related to Quaker ethics than Quakers are willing to admit. Uh, but Calvin said, if you're rich, it's not because you've got pretty eyes. Uh, it has a social purpose. Now, many of us own shares in companies. Uh, if we don't own them directly, uh, we undoubtedly own them through pension schemes and other such institutional arrangements. Now, the important point is that sh the shareholders of a company are the owners of the company. And they therefore share the responsibility for what it does. And um, one must not shirk one's responsibilities. William Penn said that Christians should keep to the helm and guide the vessel to its port, not meanly steal out at the stern of the world and leave those that are in it without a pilot to be driven by the fury of evil times upon the uh, rock of sand or sand of ruin. Now, from this point of view, and this is really the first substantive point, disinvestment, which is very popular with ethical investors these days, is a cop-out. By selling your share, you simply pass the buck. Uh, you're passing the responsibility and the dirty work that goes with it to someone else. So um, that is uh, uh, doesn't solve any problem, uh, except, of course, your own private one. It's much more important to get into the company which you own. It's your company and urge it to behave well. And in the Quakerly manner, that doesn't merely mean complain when it doesn't behave well. It also means congratulate it when it does behave well. Either way, the shareholders are, are called to engage in a continuing dialogue as insiders ready to listen as well as to talk. And here I uh, remind you of another great Quaker slogan, which is walk cheerfully, uh, answering that of God in everyone. In other words, it's very important to listen what, to what the others have to say before you tell them what they ought to do. So for a start, you can exercise your voting rights in the company's general meeting. You can, for instance, vote against the re-election of directors of whose behavior you disapprove. If there has been financial misbehavior, including tax fiddles, you can disapprove the accounts. If the auditors seem to be too cozy with the company, you can refuse to re-elect them. In any event, they should be changed regularly to avoid the development of coziness. I'll come back to other points later on, but it gives you some idea already of what you can do simply as a rank and file backbench shareholders. Now, participating in an annual general meeting uh, is a blunt instrument. At best, it's theater. The organizers, i.e. the company, can set it up 
so that those who take the floor can be made to look inadequate. Nestle, uh, I'll come back to Nestle, uh, uh, for instance, arranges the podium uh, so that when a shareholder wants to speak, uh, you have to go up two or three steps to get to a sort of lectern. And uh, there's always a hostess there who takes you by the arm and helps you up the steps as if you were likely to trip. And it makes you look weak and vulnerable. Furthermore, the audience is composed mainly of flunkies delegated by the bank or the institution which employs them to keep an eye on things and vote according to the instructions they have in their pocket. Or shareholders, mainly elderly, who regard the event as an outing. Both are looking forward, above all, to the refreshments at the end of the meeting. And so they are irritated by shareholders who delay the refreshments by making speeches. You're not talking to a receptive audience. Now, as I've said, more important than that, you are inside the company and you can seek a real dialogue, not onstage uh, dialogue. And that is the Quaker way in any event. The experience of the Swiss shareholder movement uh, is um, that I'm talking about um, is that many companies are very willing to engage in this kind of dialogue and the exchanges can indeed be enlightening both ways. They can and the association ACTA has, of which I'm a member, a founder member, um, is, uh, has found that they, they do take our comments seriously and they do modify their behavior. That's what we can do to them. They, on, we, on the other hand, get a more thorough understanding of the conditions within which the company is operating. For instance, um, Nestle, has invited us to discussions um, at uh, their headquarters where we have met not the industrial relations people and so on, but the real people whose job it is to know and who have, who've got real hands-on experience and to talk in particular about child labor in cocoa. This is a highly contentious issue at the moment um, and Nestle uh, is very conscious of the problem uh, and uh, has been trying to take steps uh, about it. Uh, but the difficulty, as they say, is there are too many cocoa farmers. Uh, the price of cocoa, the world price of cocoa, does not depend on Nestle uh, alone. Um, and uh, there's no way you can make a decent living growing cocoa. And so you're starting in a situation where these people are below subsistence and it's rough whatever you do. And so what can you do to improve um, the, the, the price of cocoa or the income that cocoa farmers get? And so Nestle has had real discussion which are two-sided, which both are listening to the other. And this is, um, I, I think, is very fruitful. Now, you can leave grandstanding and dramatic actions to outside NGOs. There are a number of NGOs who come at companies on a single issue. And they have different techniques corresponding to their role as outsiders. So they can, they, can, they can be more theatrical and they can play to the gallery. Uh, you can join them as well if you want to do, and many of us um, uh, do join them as well. But as an example, uh, Greenpeace, um, founded by Quakers in Stentley, um, 
at the annual general meeting of Nestle not long ago, a Greenpeace um, appeared from the ceiling. They suddenly dropped out of the ceiling right into the room with their banners and everything. Um, it, it was a great show, very dramatic. The press loved it. Even the, 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 the shareholders found this was entertaining. And uh, since then, Greenpeace has been brought into the ongoing Delia dialogue, which Nestle maintains uh, with um, NGOs. Uh, and when it's engaged in that kind of dialogue, it doesn't bother with the theater. It gets down to the issues. But that's to say that these techniques also have their value and uh, can be practiced, but it's not the job of the shareholders as such. Now, maybe you don't own your shares directly, but your pension fund or whatever does. Now, if I understand rightly, under uh, UK law, institutional investors are obliged to vote their shares, firstly, and secondly, to tell their members how they voted and why. I, I hope that's right. I don't know. Um, I only wish it were true in Switzerland. Um, neither of these conditions are uh, compulsory in Switzerland, so most institutionals don't bother to vote their shares at all. And if they do, you haven't got a clue how they voted them or why. So uh, if since those who of you who are in Britain uh, and who are listening uh, are having uh, funds in institutions like pension funds, tell your pension fund to uh, make sure that its shares are voted correctly and take them to task if when, as the law requires, they report, and it turns out that they didn't vote them right. Now, Quakers were pioneers in the ethical shareholder movement. I, I believe uh, they, British Quakers, invented the ethical shareholder movement. And uh, ACTAHES, the Association of Militant Shareholders I'm talking about, uh, uh, Switzerland Yearly Meeting of Quakers is, as an institution, a member of ACTAHES. It grew, ACTAHES, out of another movement, which is called CANES, the Convention of Nestle Shareholders, uh, which was founded by a uh, Protestant theologian, um, the author of the, authori the authoritative work on the social and economic thought of Calvin, who was close to Quakers. Indeed, his sister-in-law was a Quaker. Now, in due course, Canes merged with another association called the Critical Shareholders of UBS. Um, now, uh, UBS, the Union Bank of Switzerland, as was then. Um, the, this association is based in German Switzerland and is rooted in the German style of militant shareholding, which is quite a different cultural soil. Uh, there, members, as in they do in many German shareholder movements, uh, they buy a few shares a week or two before the general meeting in order to attend the meeting and sell them immediately afterwards. Uh, and they're not committed to the comp com company. On the contrary, indeed, when we were setting up a European shareholder meeting once, uh, the newly formed ACTA has, um, and I said that I was needed to open a bank account for this European meeting, and I would, of course, open it with UBS, since we were shareholders in UBS, and the critical shareholders of UBS said, what a terrible idea, you can't open a, a, a bank account with that horrible bank. So uh, this culture difference has never quite been smoothed over, and the merger has never really quite 
merger. Uh, mer yes. Um, in fact, the founders of Canes were all committed long-term shareholders. Uh, indeed, in my part of Switzerland, French-speaking Switzerland, all good bourgeois families own Nestle shares, and uh, most of us had indeed inherited our shares. Um, the hope of the founders of stock markets, uh, this is another problem, uh, was to encourage investment in shares of companies, uh, which are ideally productive in the real economy. It was to make it easier to channel funds into them and also to recover the funds if the saver needed them. That can always happen. But this motivation has been swamped by buying and selling secondhand securities as mere objects of short-term speculation. Users anxious to share in the risks, benefits, and corporate decision-making as stakeholders in the real economy like the members of ACTA has, have become folkloric curiosities. Well, I'm quite happy to be a folkloric curiosity, and I encourage you to join me in the showcase. Mm -hmm. Now, we ACTA has, uh, has some uh, routine concerns, which we always bring up in the votes in general assemblies. Uh, we publish these online uh, in advance, so you don't have to be a member of ACTAHES to vote according to our guide guidelines. Um, so they, they include that firms must meet certain internationally recognized social and environmental standards. I stress the internationally recognized, that means there are norms that are quantitative and measurable and published by an authoritative independent body. We require that auditors change regularly. In Swiss law, you discharge the board. I don't know if that exists in British law. What that means is that... Um, Hello. Hello. Sorry, I, I, I thought you were still... Sorry, I didn't hear that. Yes, and I got you some more water. Sorry, I, some more water. I didn't hear that. Um, Friends, I think if you're if you could mute if you're not speaking, that would be useful. I think there's some somebody may have a microphone on. Oh, internet. I see. That was what was going on, right? Well, I'll sorry, I'll carry on then. Uh, we also. Um, oppose, uh, because the shareholders have the right to vote on the remuneration of the fat cats in the company, and we have guidelines on what is fair remuneration and what isn't, and we vote on that. We oppose share buybacks because they are normally, uh, on the one hand, they're a fiddle that benefits certain shareholders at the expense of others, uh, but above all, because we have, our company is there to use the capital to provide goods and services that are useful to the community. And a share buyback means that they have more money than they know what to do with, and they can't think of anything to do with it. Well, we pay them to think about what they should do with their money. And if they're short of ideas, they're incompetent and they should be fired. Uh, so these are the sorts of issues we uh, uh, do deal with. Um, so I think I'm getting to the end of my time. I'll skip a few things. Uh, we are in Akhtar as asking ourselves whether we should engage in political action as well as is simply engaging in dialogue with the company. In other words, should we try to shape the legal framework within which companies operate? Now in Switzerland at the moment, the population is voting on a popular initiative uh, that will make it possible to take to court in Switzerland 
Swiss firms who fail to meet international environmental and social standards in their activities abroad. And ACTA has in institutionally uh, a, uh, uh, a supporter of this initiative for tr responsible transnationals. Uh, so incidentally, Switzerland is, has not actually signed up, but is certainly supporting it. So ACTA has makes a point of leaving completely aside anything to do with the market value of the shares in question and their financial return. Uh, we don't want our, the companies with which we're dealing to think that we're making suggestions simply because it'll make us richer at the expense of someone else. And furthermore, of course, there are lots of other people who worry about the market value of our shares. So we leave that to them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Edward. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Yeah.